Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the third webinar of our Inflammation and Immunophysiology Series 2021, a joint webinar series brought to you by Inside Scientific, the American Physiological Society, and the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. This webinar is titled Engineered T-Cells for Cancer, and will feature Dr. Marcella Maus, who is director of the Cellular Immunotherapy Program at Mass General Cancer Center and associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. In her presentation, Dr. Maus will discuss the components and technologies used in making a T-cell product, important considerations for efficacy, and underlying mechanisms of toxicity and resistance. This webinar was sponsored by Allzet, so a big thanks to them for supporting this event and for helping to make this series possible. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Marcella Maus. Uh, Marcella, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about engineered uh, T cells for cancer. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, so when we're talking about T cell therapy, we're talking about using cells as living drugs. Um, and in the current uh, system, most of the uh, uh, products are uh, autologous products, um, and all the FDA-approved T cell therapies are autologous products. And what this means is that we start by collecting a patient's own T cells or own immune effector cells through a leukapheresis uh, procedure that is carried out at the point of care, which is everything that's up here at the top in blue. Um, the cells are then shipped to a manufacturing facility where they are activated, genetically modified, expanded, and then formulated into an infusible product. Um, which is then shipped back to the point of care um, where the patients typically undergo um, moderate doses of uh, chemotherapy to help um, lymphodeplete uh, their own immune system a bit um, that will help the modified T cells engraft um, and expand as they become as they get infused into the patient. <clears throat> so there's multiple ways to engineer a T cell. Um, most of the uh, ongoing studies are using chimeric antigen receptors, although it is also possible to engineer T cells with a native T cell receptor that has a defined specificity. Um, and just as you'll recall, T cell receptors recognize a complex of MHC or HLA um, that is specific to the patient. Um, so their, that, that is what defines self in an immunologic uh, system. And the uh, HLA uh, uh, complex um, derives its antigens from the entire intracellular uh, section of the cell, the entire intracellular compartment, and processes those peptides through a proteasome um, loading of the MHC inside the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, and it gets trafficked up to the cell membrane um, where uh, antigen is presented to T cells in the context of the MHC. Um, in contrast, chimeric antigen receptors are actually engineered um, hybrid receptors that use antibody binding domains. So um, heavy and light chains derived from the variable regions of antibodies, which are then fused to T cell receptor signaling molecules and that can have additional co-stimulatory molecules engineered into the same molecular construct. In terms of antigen recognition, chimeric antigen receptors really are only able to recognize surface proteins in their native conformation, so not processed antigens, um, but notably they are MHC independent. And so with one chimeric antigen receptor construct um, and vector, one can use it um, to treat multiple patients with a given indication um, whose tumor would express the same um, surface protein. Um, Chimeric antigen receptor T cells were actually tested in multiple configurations, initially, in fact, in solid tumors and then in HIV um, before the field really took off in around 2011 when CAR T cells were first uh, published uh, that were targeting human CD19 um, as, a, as an antigen and actually um, induced complete responses in several patients. And so that was a, a really remarkable change in the field. Um, an inflection point, so to speak. Um, so CD19 turns out to be really important and really um, valuable as an antigen um, for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And the reasons for that are several fold. One is that CD19 is expressed only in the B cell compartment of hematopoietic, uh, of hematopoietic lineages. So it's not expressed in hematopoietic stem cells or any other essential tissue. 
Um, and the B cell compartment is not something that is essential for life. Um, and so you can live without your B cells. And so targeting the entire B cell compartment is an acceptable uh, toxicity um, relative to uh, the efficacy of treating a lymphoma or a leukemia. Um, the other reason that CD19 is an attractive antigen is because there are multiple tumors derived from B cells at different stages of development. Um, and so one can use the same CAR to target multiple indications. And in fact, that's what's happening right now. The first results were published in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, then in pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And then as you've seen the field move forward in the last um, 10 years or so, we've started to see um, additional trials and approvals in mantle cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, um, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, and then multiple myeloma, which it's not targeting CD19, it's targeting a different antigen. Um, but these are all diseases where CAR T cells um, have already had an impact. Um, <clears throat> there are multiple CAR designs that have been FDA approved now, um, starting as far back as 2017. Um, these are different um, chimeric antigen receptor designs. Notably, these all use the, the four on the left here use the same um, murine monoclonal antibody against human CD19 called FMC63. Um, and the most recent multiple myeloma approval, adicaptogene viclusil, um, uses a um, murine monoclonal antibody to human um, B cell maturation antigen. Um, all of these cars to basically take a single chain variable fragment, so the um, uh, heavy and light variable portions of an antibody that is fused to a hinge domain, which is shown here with these little dots, and then a transmembrane derived uh, domain from a different molecule, a co-stimulatory domain, namely either CD28 or 41BB, and the main T cell receptor signaling molecule, which is CD3 Zeta. Now, CAR T cells, I can't sort of emphasize this enough, have really transformed the treatment of patients with hematologic malignancies. And the reason it's been transformative is because all of these studies have started with patients with relapsed or refractory disease um, where they have not responded or they've had multiple prior regimens of chemotherapy and biologic therapy. Um, and yet in this very refractory, heavily pretreated patient population, the overall response rates and the durability of those, those responses has been incredible. Nothing short of remarkable, really. Um, in 2017, TISA cell was first approved for pediatric relapsed refractory ALL with an overall response rate of 83% um, in this patient population. This is something very rare in oncology for a new drug tested in such a refractory population to have response rates anything greater than 15%. Um, there was a follow-up approval in large cell lymphoma for TISA cell with an overall response rate of 50%. Um, a CAR with a different signaling domain based on CD28 called AxiCell um, was also approved for large cell lymphoma and then for follicular lymphoma. And then a very similar, the same basically molecular construct, but with a slightly different uh, manufacturing process was approved um, just last year for mantle cell lymphoma. Um, and then there's uh, potentially pending approvals as well for um, adults with ALL. Um, Lysocell is a, a different CAR T cell product. It is the only one that has a defined ratio of CD4 T cells to CD8 T cells. Um, it has a similar efficacy rate as T cell, which has a similar design. Um, and that was approved for large cell lymphoma uh, just this year, as well as the first CAR T cell product for patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, again, with an overall response rate um, that is higher than 50%. It's on the order of 72%. And some of the newer one comings the newer ones coming along <clears throat> also have approval rate, uh, um, overall response rates of greater than 90%. So just to give you a sense of what this looks like, <coughs> sorry, um, uh, how CAR T cell therapy compares to standard therapies in uh, oncology. Um, this is a, a, an older slide, but just shows that in pediatric patients with relapsed refractory um, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, chemotherapy does not tend to have uh, very good uh, overall survival or very good response rates. This was um, the first uh, uh, study, a phase two study of clofarabine in combination with etoposide and cytoxan. Oh, median overall survival was two and a half months. Um, biologic therapy, like with a bispecific antibody such as blinitumumab in a similar patient population, median overall survival of seven and a half months. And the first CAR T cell product that was approved in this population, uh, TISA gen like Lucil, had an overall response rate um, at three months of 81%, median overall survival of 19.1 months. Um, and so it's really made an, a tremendous impact. And now, of course, 
The question is whether CAR T cells will be able to move up um, further lines of therapy so they're not just used after multiple years of chemotherapy, but earlier in the course of the disease. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the mechanisms of efficacy are for CAR T cells. How do these work? Um, and what can we learn across the different classes of CAR T cell products and in different malignancies? And um, I'm going to basically make the argument that not all CAR T cell products are the same, nor do they behave the same way in all malignancies. Um, and so it is useful um, to, they have some things in common, but some things not. And it's useful um, and important to patients to start to understand um, how these work and, and in what settings. So I think the first important lesson that was drawn um, was that CAR T cells are living drugs. So the, the dose that is administered is not the final dose that the patient is exposed to. Um, in fact, CAR T cells undergo a very rapid, over the course of a week or so, expansion in the patient after infusion. And many of them, in particular the 4-MBB-based CARs, will actually persist for months. So this is the data um, back from 2011 where we only had six months of persistence. Um, but actually now that it's been close to a decade, um, we've seen that some of these patients actually continue to persist. I'm no longer at Penn, but this um, was data from University of Pennsylvania. Um, and there's patients now who were treated early on um, who are now cancer-free for um, eight, nine, or 10 years, depending on when they enrolled in the studies. Um, Emily Whitehead is shown here. She was the first pediatric patient treated, um, and her mom is an excellent photographer, and she started a foundation to raise money for cancer research. Um, and here's Emma as most recent eight years cancer-free um, uh, picture that's on the internet. Um, and she actually continues to have um, CAR T cells and a lack of um, B cells uh, in her peripheral blood uh, from my understanding of what her um, physicians have um, posted. Um, so it seems like this long-term persistence for the T cell cell product was actually important for how they function. This was um, first described in a larger group of CLL patients by David Porter in 2015, where he noted that the patients who had complete responded responses to CAR T cells not only had this expansion, but also had persisting CAR T cells, whereas the patients who didn't have responses um, or who had only partial responses really may just had, had a, a much more blunted uh, initial expansion and a lack of persistence. Um, what was interesting is that when you look at the data for the AxiCell or Brexucel product that has a CD28 signaling domain, some of that matters, but not all of it. <clears throat> so it turns out that with AxiCell or Brexucel, what really seems to matter is the area under the curve in the first 28 days or the peak number of CAR T cells that are reached in peripheral blood. And so when, when they, this was recently published data from just a couple of, uh, I think a month ago in The Lancet, um, in adults with ALL, what was shown is that the patients who had ongoing complete responses or who had relapsed disease had much higher um, levels of peak CAR T cells than the patients who did not have complete responses. Um, and that was also associated with um, toxicities related to CAR T cell expansion, namely um, cytokine release syndrome and neurologic events, um, which are transient effects um, that result when the CAR T cells are undergoing rapid expansion um, in the patient. What's interesting is that even though responses here um, uh, were durable, even though it's, it's a relatively uh, early time point, the data are not completely mature yet, um, but basically none of the 28 patients um, who were still in response or who had an initial remission um, had measurable CAR T cells at month six or 12. So although persistence seemed to be very important for the 4MBB CAR T cells in the setting of CLL, it turned out that in the setting of adult ALL here with a different co-stimulatory domain, persistence is not necessarily, not necessarily required to achieve um, complete response or durability of response. This is similar data for AxiCell, but this is just the clinical um, uh, endpoints looking at overall survival, duration of response, progression-free survival, um, showing again that <clears throat> even though there was no um, persistent CAR T cells beyond three months in these patients, the durability of the anti-tumor response was actually evident because you can see this flattening of the curve where about 40% of the patients are basically cured um, after uh, a single infusion of CAR T cells um, going out to about three years. Um, and so what is this difference? Why is the 4MBB CAR behaving differently than the 28 CAR? Why, they both seem to need this initial expansion, but the degree of persistence doesn't seem um, to have the same relationship with regard to anti-tumor effect in both of these. Um, and so one of the things that, um, that I, I, when I started my lab at, at Mass General, that we started to look at is, 
what is the transcriptional profile of CD28-based CARs versus 41BB-based CARs, and how does that relate to natural TCR signaling? Well, it turns out that by looking at bulk um, RNA sequencing and also single cell RNA sequencing, it turns out that CARs are actually relatively weak um, uh, antigen receptors. So if you stimulate the T cell receptor, you get much more T cell activation and a much more robust uh, signature of T cell activation. And if you look at principal component analysis, you can see that unstimulated cells separate the most from uh, TCR stimulated cells and CARs are sort of in between. And this doesn't, this is independent of the co-stimulatory domain of the CAR. This is just really looking at the effect of the CD3 zeta um, activation signal. The other thing that we find is that the, the length of activation, um, whether you stimulate with antigen for four hours or 24 hours, is the second principal component that comes out. Um, and if you look at sort of across the cars, you can see that the degree of, um, uh, of T cell activation is much higher with a T cell receptor than with any of the um, chimeric antigen receptors themselves. We also found in terms of looking at the difference between 41BB and CD28-based CARs is that 41BB CARs seem to have a unique um, clustering effect um, based on uh, a TISNI analysis. So looking by uh, single cell RNA sequencing, it looked like the CD3 zeta only CARs and the 28Z CARs are sort of intermingled. They don't have a defined um, cluster in TISNI space, but the 41BB CARs really do. And these are characterized by a TH1 uh, deep polarization that occurs not only at, at the transcriptional level, but also by examining um, uh, cytokine production such as IL-4, um, interferon gamma, IL-10, and others. Um, and this seems to be related to um, expression of particular genes, namely BAT F3, uh, as a, a dominant um, marker of 41BB uh, stimulation uh, in these uh, CAR T cells. We also see that 41BB CAR T cells seem to highly upregulate HLA class 1 and class 2 molecules, although we don't fully understand um, whether that has any, any implications at all for the phenotype of the T cell itself. And this can be replicated using artificial antigen presenting cells um, that uh, stimulate CAR T cells um, or uh, untransduced T cells just by providing um, 41BB stimulation through the natural ligand of 41BB ligand. And so having this uh, sort of endogenous 41BB very active stimulation seems to change the phenotype and transcriptional profile of the CAR T cells. And I think this is um, particularly interesting because we have at least one paper so far um, from Joe Freyetta and Joost Mellenhorst, um, again at University of Pennsylvania, showing that in terms of efficacy, what really mattered um, in predicting responses was not the genotype or the characteristics of the tumor, but actually the T cell attributes. Now, this is in the context of a car with a 41BB signaling domain, but it's really a sort of paradigm shifting in oncology where we've always uh, generally think about what are the tumor characteristics um, that predict prognosis or susceptibility to chemotherapy regimens or to small molecule targeted drugs. Because the T cells are living drugs, their attributes and their phenotype also has an effect um, on their activity and their clinical profile. And so what was really notable is here is that it didn't matter what the tumor prognos prognostic markers were, whether they were 17p deleted or if they had certain translocations in CLL, but instead what mattered here for complete response was whether those patients had early memory T cells that were not exhausted and a lack of T cells that were, uh, dif or that were terminally differentiated or apoptotic. And so the quality of the T cells um, was really important for um, for predicting their clinical activity. Um, and this was then further proved by a, a separate paper, but it's an N of 1 case study um, where a patient um, had a single CAR T cell actually eliminate their pounds of tumor. And what happened in this patient is that um, based on TCRV beta uh, usage, it was demonstrated that um, basically the entirety of the persisting CAR T cells several months after infusion were derived from a single TCR clone. Um, and this patient was interesting because he actually did not have the immediate um, sort of cytokine release syndrome uh, within the first you know, week after infusion. This patient presented with cytokine release syndrome and had a delayed complete response um, to the CAR T cells um, several months after the infusion. I think it was on the order of seven months. And so um, this really indicated that this single CAR T cell and its progeny um, were the ones that 
uh, that affected that anti-tumor response. Um, and it was shown that this occurred um, through, sorry, I clicked something on my computer. Um, it was shown that this occurred um, because uh, there was an integration event where the patient had an, uh, an allele of TET2 that was mutated and hypomorphic, and the car had integrated into the other normal TET2 allele. Um, and so there was basically an effective, not complete knockout, but hypofunctional knockout of TET2 that endowed these T cells with a sort of permanently uh, naive kind of state, so a, 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 a stem cell memory kind of state um, that was basically inexhaustible. Um, although these, these CAR T cells were not transformed, they did not give the patient leukemia, um, but they were able to expand and persist um, for longer uh, than, than otherwise uh, would be expected for a single um, CAR T cell clone. And so I think just to have, give you some, some thoughts about this is that I think that expansion of CAR T cell is probably uh, required across the different classes of T cell therapies um, that would induce efficacy. Um, I do think that the intracellular domain of the CAR has a role in determining this CAR T cell persistence and really dictates T cell memory formation and T cell fate. And that we also have to keep in mind that because these are um, natural cells, um, the endogenous cells, they may have additional genetic background um, that can be either leveraged or that can just um, be there serendipitously or perhaps um, in a toxic way um, where one can uh, transduce T cells where one does not necessarily know the full genetic background. And yet that background will also influence the efficacy of that T cell product and perhaps also the toxicity. And so I think this has implications for the role of clonal hematopoiesis in terms of the starting T cell product. Um, this, uh, we have a, a, a paper that's, I think that has come out recently now um, showing that in fact, many of the CAR T cell patients have some clonal hematopoiesis um, in the starting T cell product before they even get their um, cars transduced into them. It also has potential implications for the role of germline alleles that may confer uh, either desirable or undesirable characteristics of certain T cells. And um, since this webinar is uh, also sponsored by the Autoimmune um, Society, I'll say that uh, one of the questions has been um, whether patients who have underlying autoimmune disease um, will have enhanced or uh, enhanced potency or um, enhanced toxicity um, if they were to be treated with CAR T cells. This population has been excluded um, from all of the um, phase one and pivotal studies. Um, and so I don't think the field yet knows what those effects were going to be. And then there's, of course, the possibility of purposefully um, doing insertional uh, gene transduction of CARs um, to purposefully knock out uh, genes that convey either exhaustion um, or that minimize T cell expansion or efficacy. Um, so if we review now what um, some of the challenges are for CAR T cells and liquid tumors, and then we'll kind of pivot a little bit to what those challenges are in solid tumors and what we've learned from liquid that can potentially um, be used in solid. Um, so in liquid tumors, what we've seen is that CAR T cells have incredible potency. Um, I haven't gone over the data yet, but that is also associated with toxicities named cytokine release syndrome and a neurologic toxicity, which I, I mentioned. These are both related to T cell expansion um, and then downstream effects such as um, breakdown of the blood brain barrier that can occur um, either locally or diffusely. Um, there is also in liquid tumors um, the possibility of antigen escape. Um, B cell tumors had never before been shown to be CD19 negative um, until we started doing CD19 targeted therapies where um, there have been some patients who have relapsed with CD19 negative disease. Um, another challenge has been lack of persistence. Um, or lack of expansion. And again, this is um, some things that I already sort of covered a little bit in that T cell fitness, um, propensity for exhaustion, and also potentially rejection of the CAR T cells by the host due to um, the lack of uh, either to the junctions or to the um, murine components of the chimeric antigen receptor. And so some of the main challenges for CAR T cells and liquid tumors are identifying new targets um, optimizing T cell fitness um, and potentially reducing toxicity either with gene uh, edits to the T cells themselves or to use combinations with other drugs um, that are already in the armamentarium 
um, to reduce the effects of cytokine release syndrome and neurologic events. In solid tumors, there are some overlapping challenges and some non-overlapping challenges. I think the main overlapping challenge is the identification of tumor-specific targets um, that would not have on-target off-tumor uh, serious adverse events associated with them. Um, this can be more challenging, particularly in solid tumors, um, because identifying surface target antigens is not part of the routine clinical care of patients with solid tumors the way it is with patients with liquid tumors. What we've seen so far in many trials of CAR T cells targeting solid tumors is generally, generally a lack of bioactivity. It's not clear yet whether this is due to the target, due to co-stimulatory domains that perhaps need to be changed for solid tumors compared to liquid tumors, a lack of T cell trafficking, or T cell exhaustion, either because of the uh, suppressive tumor microenvironment um, or because of continuous exposure to antigen and ineffective lysis. Another issue in solid tumors is that not only is it difficult to identify one target, but solid tumors are notoriously heterogeneous, and so it likely is going to take more than one target to generate strong and durable anti-tumor effects. I would say that this has been changed just a little bit recently because there was a news report of um, uh, uh, lethal uh, toxicity in patients, uh, two patients receiving um, PSMA uh, specific CAR T cells um, where there was uh, significant cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicity. And so it's possible that the lack of bioactivity that we've seen um, uh, with some of these newer versions of CARs, that particular CAR um, had additional transgenes in it to make it resistant to the tumor microenvironment, that we'll see the pendulum start to swing the other way where a lack of bioactivity um, then changes to strong bioactivity, but then we'll need to figure out new ways of managing associated toxicities. So I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit about our own work and what we're going to pursue in terms of new targets and overcoming the challenges in both liquid and solid tumors. Um, we started with liquid tumors and one of our earlier trials is gonna be uh, targeting multiple myeloma. Um, I mentioned to you that BCM, anti-BCMA cars have recently been approved with itacaptogene viclusil. Um, this is used in a, mo a murine monoclonal antibody to human BCMA. We were also interested in pursuing a dual targeted CAR T cell that would target a second antigen on myeloma, um, ideally one that was uh, that had an overlapping function with BCMA, um, because we've seen from targeted therapies that um, there can be compensatory increases in other signaling pathways. Um, and so we thought that perhaps targeting TASI, uh, which also provides plasma cell survival signals to multiple myeloma cells in a similar way that BCMA does. And these two molecules are quite related um, in terms of their structure. And so we thought that we might be able to target both antigens using a single um, either monoclonal antibody, um, bispecific um, antibody, or uh, a, the, to use the natural ligand, which happens to cross-react with both BCMA and TASI. And the natural ligand is called APRIL. Um, it is fused, uh, it is cleaved off the membrane of myeloid cells um, and gives survival signals to both, uh, to plasma cells and multiple myeloma cells through both BCMA and TASI. Now, soluble April is a TNF family member that naturally forms a trimer. Um, and so we were interested in potentially leveraging that uh, structure to be able to optimize the binding to both BCMA and TASI. And in fact, um, Autolys has actually generated a soluble April car that uses a single molecule of April um, to target both BCMA and TASI. And unfortunately, that one um, did not have uh, anti -tumor, sufficient anti-tumor activity and that trial was held. Um, these are the clinical data uh, for the pivotal study of idacaptogene uh, viclusil um, that uses a 4-1-BB-based CAR. And what was important to show here is that, again, just like we saw with CD19-targeted uh, um, uh, CAR T cells, we saw dramatic efficacy with an overall response rate of 73%. A third of those were complete remissions or stringent complete remissions, um, and overall survival of 19.4 months with progression-free survival of 8.8 .8 months. What was interesting in this study is that the mechanism of relapse seemed to uh, be twofold. Um, one was loss of BCMA expression on myeloma, but that was actually the minority um, of the relapses. And in fact, the majority of the relapses um, that occurred did so with loss of the CAR T cell compartment and the tumor still expressing BCMA. And so I think what this means is that there are two things that we need to overcome 
um, ideally in the same car. And one is the immunogenicity of the car that may be uh, the reason for the lack of T-cell persistence with this um, particular construct. And the other is being able to target a second antigen. And so the design that we took was to make a trimeric version of the April-based molecule. Um, now we did truncate April so that it only has the BCMA and TASI binding domains and not um, some, not the cleavage site, for example, because we don't want it cleaved off the car, um, and also not the heparin sulfate proteoglycan domain. And what we found using um, reducing and non-reducing Western blots is that actually these um, tripral cars, as we call them, um, form nine different binding domains per um, molecule. So they form a trimeric configuration of a trimeric molecule, um, which is atypical in most cars actually form dimers. So the rationale for our tripral cars was to avoid relapse by targeting two antigens at once, to increase the binding affinity using this trimeric configuration to increase T cell activation, and to avoid immunogenicity because we use a fully human um, protein and there are no murine or foreign sequences in here. Um, other than the junctions, of course, between co-stimulation domains, transmembrane domains, et cetera. Um, and so we generated this um, uh, BCMA-based uh, car, an April car, and also our tripral car. And we were able to show in xenograft murine mouse models um, that uh, the trimeric April cars or triprols were able to induce complete responses in these mice at a similar rate to BCMA cars and much more efficaciously than the April cars, which were not able to induce remissions. Again, we think it's because of uh, this lack of um, sufficient binding with a monomeric April compared to a trimeric April. Um, and we were also able to demonstrate that there was uh, activity just based on the expression of TASI because we made multiple myeloma cell lines that were um, knocked out for BCMA using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing um, before engraftment into mice. And then in that setting, uh, tumor-only untransduced T cells, BCMA cars were ineffective, um, but tri tripral CAR T cells were able to still induce responses in those mice um, based on their ability to target uh, TASI. Um, now, what are we gonna do about solid tumors? Um, so solid tumors, of course, have uh, a couple of challenges besides um, tumor heterogeneity or rejection of the CAR T cells. And we were actually able to demonstrate that in humans through our early translational work um, targeting EGFR variant 3 um, in patients with glioblastoma. So we decided to go after a tumor antigen that was exclusively expressed in tumors um, and so that there would be uh, not an issue of on-target off-tumor toxicity, but we did expect that there could be an issue around tumor heterogeneity because um, even tumors that were EGFR variant 3 positive did not express necessarily EGFR V3 in a homogeneous manner. But the attractive aspects of EGFR V3 is that it is an oncogenic mutation, um, and we also knew that it was expressed in about 20% of patients with glioblastoma. And so we developed a next generation sequencing based assay um, to select patients um, for the study um, based on having EGFRV3 positive um, glioblastoma. And so we, we did all of the preclinical studies that I won't show you here. And we showed in, in mouse models um, that in tumors that were homogeneous for EGFR variant 3, we were able to induce responses in intracranial models. And we were even able to induce durable complete responses when given in combination with chemotherapy. And so based on that preclinical data, we started a phase one clinical trial and administered a single dose of EGFR V3 directed CAR T cells into the peripheral blood um, in 10 patients with glioblastoma. Uh, and what we were able to show based on um, pre and post infusion tumor resections was that CAR T cells trafficked to the tumor, they did target EGFR V3 antigen, but that there was indeed significant antigen heterogeneity and a compensatory increase in the tumor micro, uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment characterized specifically by infiltration of regulatory T cells. And so I'll walk you through some of these data, just showing that in the pre-CAR T patients, we had EGFR V3 levels um, by next generation sequencing. And then we also measured it in seven of the 10 patients who um, had a tumor resection after CAR T cells. And in most of these patients, the levels of EGFR V3 uh, went down, except in the patients who did not have significant engraftment of their CAR T cells. And this was antigen specific because the wild type EGFR amplification uh, copy numbers actually stayed the same. And you could see that both by 
next generation sequencing and also by immunohistochemistry. And then when we looked a little bit closer at the, T, at the T cell infiltrates, we were able to see that this is a single patient, but in the paper, there's actually multiple patients that are described um, where we see that after infusion of the CAR T cells into the vein, we see that these T cells get into the brain tumor but actually a relatively low percentage of them are CAR positive. And so that was sort of interesting because we didn't ex we expected that most of the tar T cells getting in there would be the CAR positive cells, but in fact, that was the minority. And in fact, these T cells were actually characterized by expression of CD25 and FOXP3. And it turned out that these were regulatory T cells. Um, and that there was also not only this uh, new infiltrate of regulatory T cells um, after the infusions, um, there was also upregulation of PDL1 expression um, on the tumor cells. And so just the infusion of the CAR T cells seemed to induce this compensatory uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment characterized by both PDL1 upregulation and a Treg infiltrate. And so the next thing that we wanted to do is try to design a CAR T cell that would target a second antigen to overcome the tumor heterogeneity that problem that we had seen with EGFR variant 3 and also bypass or co-opt those infiltrating regulatory T cells. And so the approach we took was to build on this EGFR V3 CAR but then have it secrete a T cell engaging antibody molecule that would be able to target all that wild type EGFR that was expressed in the tumor. And the idea is that this would be uh, targeting um, wild type EGFR locally, that if there was any uh, uh, leakage into peripheral blood, it would be rapidly cleared because it's by the kidney because this molecule is so small. And we had also been able to show that these um, T molecules could actually redirect Tregs and transiently make those Tregs into killer cells with cytotoxic activity. So this work was led by Brian Cho in my lab, and he was able to show that in heterogeneous intracranial tumor models, these cars that secrete team or bite molecules to EGFR are able to induce responses when that team molecule is specific to EGFR and not to CD19. And impressively, even when the tumor had no EGFR V3 expression, just having that secretion of the bite molecule was enough to induce complete responses in four out of five mice. Um, there was a lot more preclinical data that I won't show you here, um, but it, it is published. And, um, and the important thing to know is that we are now in the process of moving this um, towards a phase one trial that will start with patients who have EGFR V3 positive tumors, but then we plan to be able to enroll patients whose tumor has EGFR wild type, which is most patients with GBM, even if they lack EGFR V3 expression. Um, we were also able to identify that there was no uh, on target off tumor related toxicity um, using a skin graft model where NSG mice were grafted with human skin, which naturally expresses wild type EGFR. And then we looked at what happened when we injected CAR T cells targeting wild type EGFR. And what happens is that you get robust T cell infiltration um, and apoptosis of keratinocytes in the human skin. But if you do this with CAR EGFR V3 cells that secrete a bite molecule to CD19, um, you don't see any rejection of the graft nor do you see that when you inject CAR T cells that secrete a um, T cell engaging antibody molecule to the wild type EGFR. And so based on this, we think that um, even though in this setting we injected um, the CAR T cells uh, intravenously to maximize the exposure of the skin graft, we did not see any off tumor on target toxicity. Now I'll just remind you that CARs are molecular modular structures that can determine T cell fate. And so there's a lot of engineering that can be done to change the binding domain. You can change the single chain. You can use different kinds of binder domains, including nanobodies, cytokines, ligands, um, peptides, and synthetic molecules. You can va vary the hinge domain and the transmembrane domain. And these are all slowly but surely coming into the literature as having an impact on the efficacy and transcriptional profile of CAR T cells. In addition to what we would expect would be the primary determinants of T cell fate, namely the co-stimulation and activation domains, which can also be modulated. In addition to the CAR um, um, molecular uh, uh, changes that can be made, one can also add drugs to enhance T cell efficacy or to sensitize tumors to T cells, and one can make additional gene edits into the, into the T cells themselves to change that background information um, that may determine T cell fate. So just to walk you through, through some examples, ibrutinib is a BTK and ITK inhibitor, and we were able to show that in CLL patients, um, the treatment with ibrutinib for more than five, five cycles or more than five months basically restored T-cell proliferative potential 
and was able to enhance potency of CAR T cells in xenograft mouse models that would be expected to be completely resistant um, to ibrutinib on their own. Um, this can also be uh, changed by uh, not, not just with drugs, or T cell fate can be changed not just with drugs, but by gene edits. And in fact, Michelle Seidelin's lab and Justin Aquim um, showed a couple of years ago now that just by having the chimeric antigen receptor expression regulated through a physiologic mechanism by having targeted integration of the CAR into the TCR locus was able to reduce T cell exhaustion and behave in a more physiologic way, which we think is going to be beneficial because we know that natural T cells can provide a person with lifelong immunity and lifelong persistence with natural biologic regulation where there's expansion of the cars in response to antigen and then a reduction or contraction of those cars, of those T cells um, and formation of long-term memory. Um, there are many other ways that um, CAR T cells can be engineered um, where one can even use combinations of gene engineering and drug modulation. Um, this has been shown particularly um, elegantly by Cole uh, Royball and Wendell Lim at UCSF where they've engineered um, logic gated CARs and syn notch CARs. Um, Michelle Sadelin has also done some work with um, AND gated CARs and NOT gated CARs. And we have most recently published on len lenalidomide uh, switch cars where we can use um, uh, lenalidomide to induce, um, uh, to recruit ubiquitin ligase and induce polyubiquitination of the car in the presence of lenalidomide, which then leads to protein degradation of the car itself. And this um, is sort of asymmetric um, drug binding can also be used to engineer on switch cars so that basically the car is not signaling until um, lenalidomide is provided and then that actually triggers signaling of the car. And this is important because it turns out that this, um, and this is, I, don't, I won't show you all the slides here, but this ability to sort of turn T cell receptors on or off and be able to turn cars on or off seems to be important. T cells in, in some ways, I guess, function like a heart. They have a systole and they have a diastole. So it, it's good for T cells to be able to um, be on in response to antigen and then actually rest um, and be off. And this has been shown through a variety of different mechanisms now, um, including most recently by Crystal Makel um, and Evan Weber, who showed that transient periods of rest for T cells are able to prevent uh, T cell exhaustion um, and enhance T cell memory. And so whether we do this by having physiologic regulation of a chimeric antigen receptor, such as putting it behind the T cell receptor locus, or by doing it artificially with um, drugs or uh, agents that will induce either dimerization um, or um, turning cars off to uh, let the T cell rest, I think is going to be uh, a form of a next generation car that may have increased efficacy um, in both liquid tumors and solid tumors to enhance T cell function. I'll just show you two of our data slides with len lenalidomide um, off switches. We were able to show that um, by exposing um, CAR T cells um, to lenalidomide in vivo, um, there was uh, we demonstrated uh, rapid degradation of the CAR based on bioluminescence um, six hours later. And then uh, with that single dose, then the CAR, the CAR expression comes back after 24 hours. Um, and this is important because you can develop um, these off switches to be able to transiently control cytokine release so that we don't have to use necessarily high dose steroids or ways of killing the T cells immediately, but instead we can sort of temper the cytokine activity of the CAR T cells um, and still um, be able to have the long-term anti-tumor effects um, uh, in patients. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this field is that it has really developed in the space of academia. It has now, of course, become a very large industry endeavor as well, um, but it is possible to actually go from uh, an idea and a, a construct um, in academia all the way to phase one clinical trials. So um, I've been at MGH now for six years and we have a, a pipeline of CAR T cell trials that we're starting, including um, testing uh, new targets in BN T cell lymphoma, um, testing our trimeric April CAR, which I showed you as, as tripral, and then also um, looking at the um, CAR team E, which is the uh, bispecific secreting um, CAR T that I, showed, that I showed you in glioblastoma. And so um, I think this is important because it's a way of not only um, developing new products for patients, but also understanding the biology and the mechanisms of action and toxicity and resistance um, from these very interesting um, living and modifiable complex therapeutics.
I'll also say that engineered immune cells have become a platform for testing synthetic biology and lots of novel ideas. So um, many of the gene editing technologies, including CRISPR-Cas9, um, prime editing, um, and various other uh, systems um, need to be tested in a, in a cell-based setting. And so the TACAR T-cell has become a platform for that. Um, there's also been testing of iPS-derived immune cells, T-cell subsets, and NK cells, all with the goal of uh, treating patients with products that are fit for purpose. Um, this has led to an explosion of growth in the field. Um, it can be a little bit anxiety provoking at times, I suppose, but I think um, it's just to show um, how exciting this is. That uh, If you look at um, CAR T cells in PubMed, this is the, we're still in a log phase growth um, uh, starting from around you know, 2012 when uh, there was really an inflection point here. Um, and then this is also translated to CAR T cells uh, uh, clinical trials um, based on searches in clinicaltrials.gov. So in conclusion, CAR T cells targeting C19 um, have entered mainstream practice in academic medical centers in the US. Um, there is extensive regulation required by the FDA fact and others for training, reporting, and compliance, but it's also possible um, to do first in human um, uh, proof of concept clinical trials within the academic setting. Um, and one can work with these various um, regulatory agencies to do that um, safely and in, in, in an informative way. Financial toxicity is an issue I didn't um, talk about, but it is an ongoing issue and um, making these cell products is expensive and finding a way to do that in a scalable way such that patients can benefit um, not only in the first world, but also um, across uh, the globe, I think is going to be important. And just to summarize, I think there's just been rapid growth in our field. There's converging new biologic advances and rapid translational uh, activities into clinical trials. And the bioactivity is what's really driving all of this. It's been impressive, both in terms of the responses, the durability of responses, and the occasional toxicities, which uh, fortunately have mostly been um, managed clinically to date. Um, so uh, I just wanted to thank the people in my lab who did the work. Um, this is our, our Moss Lab CAR-T team and our um, uh, uh, collaborators and also our funding sponsors. And thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mez, for the really fantastic presentation. Uh, all right, the first question here, um, is it, is the potential for autoimmune adverse events greater with CAR T cells or so-called checkpoint blockers? Uh, um, very interesting question. Um, gosh, I'm not sure. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, um, most of the CAR T cell, uh, all of the CAR T cell trials have really excluded patients with autoimmune disease. I think it probably depends on how big the clone is and a little bit of, um, a sort of probability because I think if you were to transduce a CAR T cell that also had a self-reactive T cell clone, it's possible that that T cell clone would be um, kind of enhanced, but it would be just the ones that got transduced. Um, and what we've also seen in sort of in, in mouse models, it's not officially published as such, is that the CAR activity kind of tends to dominate. So one thing we've seen, for example, is that patients who've received um, CAR T cells in a post allo setting, um, and they've received CAR T cells from the manufactured from their original allogeneic stem cell transplant donor, is that it's actually safe. So there's not been an increase in graft versus host disease in those patients. So I would say that I don't have um, sort of full numbers and, and data uh, to answer the question, but my suspicion is that um, CAR T cells would are less likely to cause autoimmune disease um, based on a relatively low percentage of the T cells that get transduced from the total body T cell mass. Um, and because the CAR sort of dominates more over uh, signaling through the T cell receptor, even if it's an autologous self-reactive clone. Whereas checkpoint blockade, you know, it's getting all of the T cells. And so you're really modifying the entire compartment that could be self-reactive. And so it's going to be multiple um, self-reactive clones that have their peripheral tolerance mechanisms shut off. So I suppose that if, if, uh, if I had to wager, I think that CAR T cells in a patient with autoimmune disease were probably less problematic than checkpoint blockade in that population. Interesting. Fantastic. Great answer. Um, 
Next question here. What do you think about the potential for allergenic versus autologous CAR-T therapies? Yeah, that's a question that, that comes up a lot. Um, allogeneic cells, I think, are very attractive to the industry in the sense that, you know, CAR-T cells are regulated like drugs. And so being able to have sort of complete control over the quality attributes and the, the, the target product profile of the drug is, is a very important part of the sort of the regulatory strategy and the commercialization. Um, I think, unfortunately, the biology is not necessarily working with us in that setting. Um, I think years of, you know, medical progress in transplantation and in autoimmune disease would indicate that rejection in either direction, so either, you know, graft versus host disease or uh, host versus rejection of the incoming T cells, those are like real <laughs> biologic robust mechanisms um, that I think are going to be quite difficult to overcome. I mean, if we think about how complicated it is to do a transplant in terms of how much immune suppression is required to maintain the tolerance to the graft, both for, um, for you know, for bone marrow transplant and for solid organ transplant, I just have a hard time imagining that halogenic T cells are going to have anywhere near the persistence or efficacy that autologous T cells will. Um, but on the other hand, it makes the regulatory process um, much more potentially much more feasible. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, in this field, those are still sort of dichotomous um, where, you know, to make it to make it commercializable off this, uh, you know, off the shelf, um, sort of large scale manufacturing, you kind of want an aloe product. But to really leverage the biology of the T cell, it makes much more sense to stay in an autologous product. So I think it's um it's sort of a I suppose I would say that it's a bit of a conflict in the field about how to best approach this. Um, I, I think it also is potentially ripe for really understanding more about transplantation and gene editing. And so a lot of the gene editing tools are going to be used to try to make allogeneic um, T cells or allogeneic and K cells more tolerable. And perhaps we'll learn from that experience um, to be able to facilitate um, organ transplant or um, to, to manage autoimmune disease even. Um, I, I will say that there are already trials and data that's being published with allogeneic um, CAR T cells that have been gene edited. And what looks to be required is a really deep immunosuppression of the host um, in order to get sufficient expansion and anti-tumor effect of the incoming um, products. And so then we're sort of um, stuck a little bit in you know, how much immunosuppression of the host is going to be tolerable um, uh, on a large scale as well. So I think it's to be determined, um, but there's definitely a lot of activity on both sides. Excellent. Some really great points there. Um, here's a good question. What are the preferred imaging modalities for assessing response to CAR T cell therapy? And can imaging studies predict response to treatment in this setting? Um, that's a great question. There's a lot of people who've been very interested in trying to image the T cells themselves. I would say they're not quite ready for clinical prime time or clinical decision making. Right now, most of the imaging modalities are really based on the standard of care for the disease. Um, so in lymphoma, there's, of course, a lot of use of um, FDG PET and CT scans. Um, in myeloma, it's you know, it can include MRI, but it's also really mostly blood based markers and bone marrow biopsy. Um, so I would say it, it's to be determined. I'm not sure that there are imaging modalities that are yet predictive of response. I would say it's mostly being used to assess response. Um, I will say that there is a question sometimes when, when someone has a PET scan sort of earlier on, and we sometimes see PET scans sort of convert from partial responses to complete responses, um, and that, that goes for t CT scans as well. And sometimes you see it light up on PET, and those can actually be CAR T cells if they're still very active. Um, and so the, the kinetics of when we expect responses were really drawn, in terms of response criteria, were really drawn initially upon you know, cyto cytotoxic chemotherapy. And just like we saw with immune-related um, response criteria, um, CAR T cells tend to behave a little bit closer to chemo than checkpoint blockade in that setting. But I would say that it, it can be somewhere in between.
Fantastic. Um, I think we have time for just a few more questions here. Um, do you think there's potential for CAR T cell therapies outside of oncology and autoimmune disease? Yes. So I didn't talk about it as much because I'm I'm an oncologist and that's what I have you know most of my um, most of my effort and, and training in. Um, but we and others and we're collaborating with others to engineer T regs um, with cars um, to try to enhance uh, organ tolerance. Um, so I think that there are indications beyond um, cancer. Um, I know that there was also a paper recently about engineering CAR T cells to target cardiac fibrosis. Um, I don't know how often that that happens clinically or whether it's ready for prime time, but uh, you know it's easier probably to engineer T cells to be killers of something, um, whether that's excess fibrotic tissue or um, you know a tumor mass than it is to engineer them to be suppressive. Um, but I think both are feasible. Um, there's also been some CAR-T uh, preclinical studies against infectious disease, so in, including HIV and even aspergillus, like fungal infections. Um, so I think that there's potential in a lot of other indications beyond cancer. That's really cool, I love it. Um, and I think in the interest of time, we'll just make this next question the last one. Uh, is the key with the triapral molecular clustering on the cell membrane, and is it thus a nonspecific effect? Um, it's an interesting question. I think um, we we think that it does enhance antigen binding, and we don't see sort of a nonspecific clustering and tonic signaling or activation of the car in the absence of antigen. Um, so I I, I don't. There are some cars where there is tonic signaling, where the, the single chains sort of interact with each other or aggregate on the surface and therefore cause signaling of the car, irrespective of the presence of antigen. We have not seen that with our tripral car, so we think that it's through it. Um, we think that that formation of the trimer is a is a changes the binding affinity, but not the um, not a tonic signaling issue. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Mouse, for the really fantastic insights today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much. Definitely. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today to attend the webinar. And last but not least, we'd also like to thank Alzet for sponsoring this event. So in closing, thanks again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society and the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association. And I'll see you again next time. Have a great day, everyone.